So uh, briefly, as Carol mentioned, I'm a certified instructor for the SANS Institute and also uh, one of the authors for uh, SEC 617, uh, our wireless security uh, and penetration testing course. Uh, and what I wanted to do today is uh, give you some introduction to uh, some of the software defined radio things that we actually uh, do in in the course. Um, we have uh, uh, lots of lots of stuff that we do throughout the throughout the week through Wi-Fi and uh, Zigbee and digital enhanced cordless telephony and uh, Bluetooth low energy and Bluetooth and Z-Wave and, and and all sorts of uh, fun stuff. Uh, but some of the the new things that we're bringing is some of the software defined radio. Uh, it ends up being very much sort of a, a high level analysis of the software defined radio but it's very much a getting you started and pointing you in the right directions for uh where you want to, to for something you should uh consider uh for continuing with um so to that today i wanted to give even sort of a higher level uh look at some of the things that uh, that we cover in class and so some of my uh my former students this will very much be a review <laughs> So, um, because he, in fact, the slide deck is actually pulled directly from the course uh, with a few extra little uh, caveats and so forth. So I've got a lot to cover, so let's uh, let's get right to it. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about what software-defined radio is, uh, when it's appropriate to use uh, on a penetration test of, of some variety, uh, a little bit of the, some uh, platform selection. Uh, we'll go through that a, a, a little quick. Um, and we'll just focus on some of my favorites, but the rest of it is there. Um, some talking about some projects that are already in existence that uh, can give us a, a step in the right direction for using some software-defined radio and uh, what, what we can do with some of, some of that data and get you thinking critically sort of about um, where radio gets used that we may not, may not necessarily know about. And then some things about for us to think about when to and when not to use software-defined radio. All right, so what software defined radio? Uh, you know, it, quickly, it is a a set of radio um, hardware um, that is not limited by by single purpose. Uh, as I mentioned in class, uh, many of us still have an AM FM radio in the dash of our automobiles, uh, and that uh, that device is um, only uh, <clears throat> does. Um, AM and FM demodulation. It was purpose built to do those things. Uh, with a software defined radio, it's the, a receiver and or transmitter uh, effectively attached to a computer um, that we have to tell it what to do in software. Uh, and it has no preconceived notion. It's not limited to specific demodulation types. Uh, it's only limited by our imagination and the ability for us to do some programming. Uh, that that programming and or interaction with those radios is is done in a couple of different ways. Um, some folks have taken the time to create some very specific packages uh, and or software applications to work with uh, the software defined radios to do a specific purpose. Hey Larry, uh, but, uh, excuse the interruption. I'm no, not sure if we uh, unpaused screen share. I just wanted to double check that. Oh, I thought I had. And no, it had, <laughs> it had, uh, and it, it it went away again. So, all right, great. Uh, yep. Thanks. So, to, no problem. So, to step back, um, our our introduction, some of the things that we wanted to cover, and then what is software defined radio. So that was very strange, Carol. I, I specifically went in and clicked the play button, and well, it it came unplayed. So here we are. Um, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> it, it happens. It happens. Technology yeah. is a wonderful thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so to that, um, we have a couple of things we can do. Uh, we can use some software uh, purpose built to do a specific function. And then we can take that same software to find radio, do a control C on our application and have it do another application. Very much unlike our, our radio in the dash of our car. Okay. Um, we can also use a multi-purpose tool uh, such as uh, GNU Radio and GNU Radio Companion to build radios um, out of various blocks and programming uh, in very similar types of fashion and have it do all sorts of things. Uh, it can require lots of work and uh, lots of moving parts to, to make it happen, uh, but uh, certainly there's some things out there that we can do to get started with. 
Okay, so looking at the software defined radio generically, um, we've got some RF front end, a radio with some uh, analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters, depending on our transmitter receive capability, uh, tied to some processing capability in FPGA, uh, and then potentially tied to some um, uh, processing uh, with a PC, uh, with some sort of software telling all of these parts uh, what to do. All right. <clears throat> so why would we consider uh, software-defined radio? Uh, the big one is that software-defined radio, because it has no concept of what it needs to do, we can, we're now limited just by our imagination. Uh, and by interacting with all of these um, RF energy outputs that are, are there that we may not have previously had access to, uh, because the, the tool set was, was limited. Uh, in many cases, uh, what we're still finding is that uh, radio was designed by folks that said, uh, the only way you're going to get access to this is if you take our hardware and turn it into an attack tool. Uh, and some of these pieces of hardware may be fairly esoteric uh, and difficult to find. Um, so th there's a, a significant limit to, to any of those types of attacks. And, and those radios and protocols uh, designed uh, security through obscurity. Uh, now, with uh, lots of uh, software-defined radio, gives us uh, the exposure to all of these things that had been previously inaccessible. So, and in my personal opinion, I think we're going to see more of these uh, as time goes on, especially with the rise of the Internet of Things. And as Jason and I were talking about uh, prior to the show, um, I find that we're, we're developing new communications methods using RF um, before some of the previous ones that we've already developed to solve a problem have been implemented and uh, had some good security uh, audit to them. Okay. So with software-defined radio, it's definitely not going to be um, our first avenue of attack unless we're uh, scoped specifically to look at things um, that, that are sort of outside of uh, the norm. Um, in using this for a pen test, it's going to be a very time-consuming uh, process. Uh, but if given a fairly wide scope, many organizations don't know that they're using some sort of uh, pseudo-proprietary uh, wireless capabilities and, and may not understand what that risk of exposure is, um, given that they don't even know that it's there. Right. Uh, and, and absolutely given that these are somewhat fairly esoteric type of things, uh, they can take some time to to pull off, um, at, but can be extremely damaging. I, I think back to Bastille Research's uh, uh, stuff recently with the, uh, the warning sirens. <clears throat> um, and when I talk about damaging there, certainly if we were to trigger those sirens for some sort of um, natural disaster, uh, very similar to what happened with the SMS messages in Hawaii, um, you know, that could cause widespread panic and potentially cause uh, life safety issues. Okay. Some other things to think about is that software-defined radio isn't just for audit and, and attack capabilities. Because it has no predefined notion of, of purpose, uh, we can use these uh, software-defined radios to do, to, uh, to do some other things as well. A um, little self-serving interest um, Myself and uh, my now former intern, uh, Faith Alderson, uh, put together a project uh, called uh, Vapor Trail. And uh, what Vapor Trail was, was a, or is rather, a uh, Raspberry Pi with a length of wire connected to uh, uh, one of the GPIO pins in which uh, we send data out over uh, uh, terrestrial broadcast FM radio and then have it received by a uh, very inexpensive software-defined radio, such as the RTL-SDR. Uh, the intent here was to do data exfiltration over a custom proprietary digital mode uh, over something that we figured most people were not uh, listening for. So not only can we use software-defined radio to investigate everything that is around us, we can now build new applications for, for radio. It's just limited by our creativity. Okay. So Thinking about which software to find uh, radio we want to use, uh, there are many, many options. Not all of them are created uh, created equal. 
Uh, and, and I'd argue that there's no right fit for any one job, uh, but I want to talk about some of my favorites. Okay, uh, so one of my favorites is the the HackRF one. Um, lots of uh, community support here. Um, open source software, open source hardware, uh, and some uh, some other derivatives and other fun stuff to go along with it, such as the the Chaos Communication Congress uh, radio uh, with a one. Uh, instead of an I, uh, was based on the open source design uh, and is effectively a HackRF1 in a, in a wearable conference badge, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then an addition, an add-on to the HackRF1 with the Portapack, uh, which effectively removes all of the computing resources directly onto an additional board that you, you plug into your HackRF1 through the uh, through the expansion port. Uh, and, and there's multiple firmwares for that Portapack as well. Um, to um, uh, enable all sorts of fun features. Okay. Uh, Blader F, uh, also another one uh, that is uh, well full featured, uh, a, a little bit more full featured than the Hacker F1. Uh, specifically, it can do full duplex communications, uh, specifically designed to uh, be a great platform for doing open BTS and open LTE. So we could create our own cellular base stations. Now, that's not its only purpose because it's a software defined radio. Uh, the designers uh, from Nuon just had some specific applications they wanted. Uh, to make sure that they support it. Okay. Uh, one of my absolute favorites, aside from the Hacker F1, which can do transmit and receive, are the RTL SDR <clears throat> uh, digital broadcast TV tuners. Um, these are incredibly inexpensive. Uh, they they are unfortunately receive only, and and they're not super full feature set. But this is my uh, arguably my day to day uh, uh, go to, uh, specifically because they're they're small, they're portable. I can uh, swap out the antennas, and if I'm sitting on the sofa trying to do some analysis, I don't have to drag out the big bulky stuff. Um, and they're inexpensive, so I can deploy them all over the place. Uh, uh, without having to worry about that I'm going to lose some $300 software-defined radio. Uh, I have a number of these tied to Raspberry Pis in my attic, you know, doing various types of, of monitoring. Uh, and, and I'll talk about uh, one of those as well. Okay. So arguably one of my favorite, but very much uh, limited on their capabilities. Okay. Some other stuff that really concerns me as well <clears throat> is that we now have the ability to do software-defined radio and things that we didn't even realize could be software-defined radio. So to start talking about um, some of the additional threat of uh, unknown stuff, um, we found that the RTL-SDR is, is receive-only, uh, but now with um, these uh, FL2K, uh, the FL2000 chipsets in USB to VGA adapters, um, if you interact with those uh, FL2000 chipsets, they can be used to toggle one of the pins that would drive the VGA monitors and turn those into a transmitter. So now we can have a potential um, low fidelity, low feature set receiver transmitter pair um, for under $50 for one of these um, uh, transmitters with the USB to VGA adapters and an RTL SDR. So that becomes kind of scary to me is that now we're potentially taking devices that are in our environment and are potentially able to be turned into transmitters uh, and then port something like vapor trail to that so that we have things in the environment that are expected to be there uh, to do data exfiltration. So knowing that some of these types of things are there in the environment might be helpful. Okay. There's a couple of other ones uh, as well. Uh, specifically draw attention to the Lime SDR stuff. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, varieties now and they've got this really great um, uh, uh community behind them uh and, and are very very affordable for for what the feature set is okay roll up of all of those we'll leave that just uh for a minute so that you can go back and pause the webcast later and review that okay so we've got a software defined radio how do we find stuff in my opinion uh i, I i'm very much a visual person i, I want to see and then potentially hear uh, so uh, some of my favorite ways is to turn that R of energy into something that I can see uh, and to visualize what's there. And we'll talk about um, a couple of these real quick. Uh, one of my favorites personally is GQRX. 
for interacting with my software to find radio to interact with the spectrum and provide um, some visual visualization of, of what's available uh, in the environment. I particularly like GQRX, even though it can be a little bit buggy from time to time, is that it supports the two major platforms um, that I use, uh, OS X and Linux. Um, just, there, there are tons of these types of things out there. This happens to be one of my favorites. So looking at the display, uh, we attach our software to find radio, start up GQRX, uh, and then we can... <clears throat> uh, look at the spectrum. We can scroll through the spectrum and get a real-time uh, fast Fourier transform graph pretty much right in the middle there. And we can see spikes for where signal are be currently being transmitted. We can take that uh, if we remain stationary and don't tune for a historical waterfall. Um, we can change our frequency uh, and move around the various spectrum that uh, our software-defined radio uh, is capable of tuning, and then perform a lot of basic actions uh, with that, uh, for example, changing the demodulation type uh, with just a click of a button. So to me, that's that's pretty interesting in that I can fire up my software to find radio and I can see that there's a signal there. Now it becomes a question of what's it do? Okay. Uh, another one uh, under Windows is SDR Sharp. Um, it is a closed source uh, now, but I also do like it. The big one is that the, the plugin support for SDR Sharp under Windows um, is significantly better than GQRX. And it looks very similar. The, uh, the options are, are swapped, but we've got our frequency selection, our fast Fourier transform, real-time graph, and our historical waterfall display, and, and significantly more plugins and options available to us. Okay. <clears throat> Another one that I think is, is pretty interesting, when we start thinking about something like Vapor Trail and or those, uh, the FL2000 um, transmitters, USB to VGA transmitters, this is introducing something new in the environment that wasn't there before. So in order to detect that, we need to have some sort of baseline. And one of the ways that I think building a baseline is uh, with something like RTL power and then uh, converting that into something I can visualize. So uh, by using um, RTL power, uh, an application that comes with the RTL SDR um, packages, uh, we can have our software defined radio, specifically our RTL SDR, sweep through various areas of the spectrum and record the signal strength and write that to a CSV file. We can then take that CSV file with heat map and generate that into something that we can visualize. For example, um, this particular um, uh, output from a heat map captured with um, uh, RTL power um, shows where some signals are present and sort of how it has changed. If you look a little bit above uh, where it says the slight deviation in signal, sure, uh, right above that red box, sort of between slight deviation and signal and where it says display fm.png, uh, that is a little bit more telling to me in that there's some darker and lighter spots and meaning something has changed there. If I think about this, the lighter, uh, more bright yellow is where there's a stronger signal. And what happens if we take one of those dark spots and then all of a sudden as time goes on in this display, this is like a waterfall display, a new signal shows up that's fairly bright. Well, in that period in which we did some monitoring, something in the environment changed. Maybe that's a presence of a new transmitter of some variety, uh, unknown what it does, but something new showed up. Okay, so I, I think that's pretty cool. That would be a way that I would use to detect something like uh, an uh, implementation of Vapor Trail. Okay. There are tons of projects that we can start using um, with our software defined radio uh, to give us some ideas and some indicators of what uh, it looks like for some of these projects and demonstrating some risks in some of the formerly known uh, as security through obscurity. So doing a quick look through uh, of some of these. Um, one of them, uh, one of my favorites, I have one of these displays running in my office, a Raspberry Pi attached to an RTL SDR, specifically tuned to 1090 megahertz, uh, passed to uh, an application called Dump 1090. <clears throat> Dump 1090 listens on 1090, meg 1090 megahertz and understands the ADSB um, aircraft beacon protocol. 
These are unencrypted uh, beacons from aircraft that uh, give all sorts of interesting information, including uh, their tail numbers, uh, the altitude, their heading, uh, their speed, and in many cases, this is also uh, GPS latitude and longitude. Now that's kind of interesting in that all of the aircraft um, headed into the United States uh, by the federal, uh, the FAA, um, are required to have uh, active ADSB beacons by the year 2020. And, and that's some decent time from now. Great. We can now monitor aircraft. Cool. We can do this on our own with our own software defined radio, uh, and we can put it on a map. But Larry, this stuff is available from the internet. Great. Yes, and my, uh, my my answer is, how do you think it got there? Uh, other folks like me go and listen to ADSB and then populate that out to uh, to the internet for sharing. So Larry, why do we care about uh, ADSB monitoring? Well, if we know about the protocol and we can decode the protocol, we now have enough information to potentially take our own data and encode that. Um, one, maybe we take a previously recorded data and replay it, or we start crafting our own. And it is my understanding and uh, the understanding of, uh, of a number of other folks, one of my good friends, uh, Brad Haynes, uh, otherwise known as RenderMan, um, posited that how does ADSB get used? Uh, well, not only does it get used by the uh, aircraft control towers, uh, the understanding was that the onboard systems can also uh, monitor ADSB to look for other aircraft in its local area and then help the, uh, the autopilot uh, on the aircraft uh, perform various actions to provide uh, avoidance of, of other aircraft. So if we have two aircraft that are uh, flying in fairly close proximity and they are at the same altitude, um, the autopilot can make some logic and decide that uh, we're automatically going to change altitude with some, um, uh, some uh, interaction with the various authorities to change our altitude off by uh, 2,000 feet so we don't have a mid-air collision. So what happens if we could take our own information and transmit that out as, a, as an aircraft, uh, whether we spoof those packets or we do that in, say, a flight simulator and fly around a major airport at a, an altitude just above uh, some of the other aircraft, potentially turning um, uh, automatic pilot to change its altitude, either higher or lower. Uh, and, and what if we change those uh, by inserting fake aircraft into the airwaves that are interpreted by autopilot uh, to potentially push that at a significantly low altitude, uh, altitude lower than the altitude of the ground. Um, that could be potentially dangerous. And mind you, all of this is unencrypted data. Uh, so no keys required, no brute forcing. Um, it, is, it is all in plain text. Um, Brad Haynes at DEF CON 20 with some others uh, demonstrated this uh, by taking an actual flight simulator and enabling the flight simulator to be able to transmit ADSB and flew an aircraft uh, called Your Mom uh, around and had it available uh, in the general air. Now, in the general air, it was into a, a quote, dummy load so that it didn't actually escape and was done under very controlled circumstances. So absolutely, uh, Chris writes in with a question, can a speaker cover any issue concerning the FCC regulations and SDR transmissions such as vapor trail? Uh, absolutely, um, to, to think about something like vapor trail, um, vapor trail is using uh, FM broadcast, so FM broadcast range. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, just about anywhere on the planet and specifically in the US FCC, uh, we are absolutely permitted as a regular consumer without a license to transmit in a couple of different locations. One, the industrial scientific and medical bands. Um, those are typically around uh, 433 megahertz, 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. All of that stuff we're using as radio transmission today without a license. Uh, so absolutely, we are more than welcome to transmit there. You know, 
be a good citizen and, and, and transmit appropriately there. Um, with a ham radio license, you can transmit in other areas by also being a good citizen and following the rules. Uh, specifically with Vapor Trail, uh, for the FM terrestrial broadcast range, and to the best of my knowledge, all over the world, uh, at a low power, you are very much permitted to, to transmit uh, FM broadcast signals, as long as you are being a good good citizen. Um, thinking about this, um, up until fairly recently, I had a fairly old automobile, and the only way I could get my iPod connected to my stereo was through one of those little FM transmitters that plugged into the cigarette lighter. Uh, and you tune my, your radio to you know 87.7 uh, in the dash, and uh, the cigarette lighter with the uh, eighth inch jack into my uh, iPhone was effectively a very low power FM transmitter. That's effectively uh, what the uh, what Vapor Trail is, is a low power FM transmitter, uh, which the FCC says we are, we are perfectly capable of doing as long as we're being good citizens within some ranges and vapor trail is in fact one of those it is absolutely possible to go outside of all of those rules with all of these tools um, so so be careful and, and be responsible Chris I hope that uh, addressed your question Okay, so for, for ADSB being responsible by transmitting into that dummy load, uh, because it's technically illegal uh, for anyone to transmit on 1090 megahertz without some specific licensing. Okay. Um, some other ones uh, for some, some other projects that are interesting out there, um, POXAG and Flex Pager Traffic, uh, very much old school variety of capture uh, beeper traffic. Um, this is again a protocol that is uh, entirely in plain text, um, uh, unlikely to change the protocol given the, the one, the age of the protocol and the current install base, um, having to change out a number of pieces of hardware to support any additional encryption. Okay. And I can see the, uh, the question going through your mind of, Larry, who uses pagers and beepers anymore? Um, lots of uh, lots of folks uh, are still using them um, through you know, fire EMS um, healthcare organizations such as hospitals are, are still very much invested in poxag and flex um, I still um, have seen uh, folks in in various industries that do monitoring such as either technology or otherwise alarm systems for for example, uh, that very much use pager traffic to indicate some sort of alarms or some sort of air condition, say a disk being full or that um, a window sensor has been tripped and is sending a notification to the alarm company. <clears throat> or that sending for the alarm company, sending their uh, uh, dispatch to, to one of their, their folks in the field. So lots of application for POXAG and FLEX uh, still as well. Um, lots of stuff still out there. Easy to receive with a software-defined radio, maybe not so easy to transmit um, because our software-defined radios are typically fairly low power, so we'd have to be within a uh, close range of our, uh, quote, uh, quote, victim. Um, it, it may be possible to inject fake messages, uh, but again, we're probably going to have to be fairly close. Um, uh, the way the pagers uh, companies get away with it, they're using some fairly high power transmitters and are using networks of transmitters over larger areas um, to, to be able to cover various regions and uh, over the United States as well and other areas. Okay. Things to think about here. <clears throat> Quickly, it may be illegal to decode pages that are not destined for you, are not destined to your recipient address, uh, your cap code. Um, so check into your local laws. Um, there's been lots of discussion recently about whether it is or isn't. Um, and there's been some other presentations that say, yes, it's perfectly legal as long as you don't store them. Um, some other ones that here in the US, uh, no one has ever been prosecuted for capturing pager traffic that's not destined for you. They've only been pro pro prosecuted for capturing pager traffic that was not destined for the recipient and displaying it to a third party. Because that's, if you do it and you don't show anybody or don't tell anybody, how does anybody know? There is no way to know. Um, so with a third party is where folks have really gotten in trouble. <clears throat> so 
just some things to think about. I'm not a lawyer. Don't construe this as legal advice. I didn't say it at Holiday Inn Express last night. So, so please be careful. Okay. So <clears throat> in order to do um, um, capture of pager traffic, it's fairly easy with an RTL SDR. We just need to know what frequency to tune into. Uh, one of the ones that I've had success uh, in, in my areas when I've been traveling around is 152.5 or so, uh, or 0.6 megahertz. <clears throat> um, we can use uh, RTL FM that comes with our software defined radio package for the RTL SDR <coughs> and pipe that to a decoder uh, such as Multimon, uh, Multimon NG or Multimon Next Generation, which understands how to decode the audio tones received by the radio. Uh, and convert that back into the actual uh, ones and zeros for us and give us the, the pages. Um, so some great things here. There's lots of information that goes out on these things. Some of it fairly scary, especially when we start talking about um, uh, the HIPAA related stuff, um, the, the, the electronic patient health information or PII, um, as well as just some of the data that may be interesting for us as pen testers. Um, you know, IP addresses, system names, email addresses. So lo lots of lots of things out there. All right, some other ones is, yeah, in my opinion, the truest sense of, uh, of a hack by taking something that was intended to do one thing and then leveraging the way that works to have it do something completely unintended. Okay. Uh, so here in the U.S., there's uh, you know there's the the thing about the stingrays uh, provided to law enforcement. Effectively, a stingray is a fake cell tower uh, to get folks to connect to uh, to said fake uh, cell tower to uh, to be men in the middle and or to be able to do location tracking for the unique identifiers for individual phones. Now, that said, whether or not they use them, that's a whole political discussion. But much like something like deploying vapor trail in an environment, something has changed. Cellular towers at a fixed location should remain fixed. They, they're expensive to deploy. Um, typically, your cell providers aren't going and standing up and tearing down cell towers with any sort of regu regularity. Um, it, they're typically in fixed locations, and they should have some fairly standard um, signal strength based on, on where you are if you don't move. It should be fairly fairly static environment. So if we do a baseline and observe things that are new in the environment, <clears throat> something has changed, and maybe there's uh, an MC catcher or something like a, a new cellular tower uh, been deployed. I equate this to something similar to uh, rogue AP detection for Wi-Fi. Okay. What we can do to sort of build this uh, on our own is we can use the Calibrate tool. Uh, Calibrate is um, intended to tune into very specific licensed well-known frequencies for cellular towers. They are on very specific frequencies. They are set um, based on the providers and that the phones know where to tune in, and they'll always be at specific channels on specific frequencies. Uh, it, it's static. It's fixed. Calibrate does tuning with our software-defined radio, in this case an RTL-SDR, to look for the presence of RF energy on those channels with some deviation. The intent is that if we observe our RF energy uh, close to where one of these channels is supposed to be, we can tell how far off our actual receiver is based on temperature and there's some variation in an expensive device. So we now need to know what the potential offset is for the real frequency based on, on what we know where something is to be. Great. So let's do that. Let's have it do that scans, but then build a database of, of what happens. Um, a, a, there's a Ruby script out there for uh, taking the output of Calibrate running it in a loop over time and building effectively a database um, of what is available for the uh, the current um, uh, cellular towers that are present that have been observed and then can note when things change. For example, maybe one of the cellular towers went away uh, or maybe one has, has appeared. And going through the loop, 
have potentially no changes as well. So taking a tool that was was built for us to determine our frequency offset to see how far our radio was off by, by continually doing that and, and building a, uh, uh, a background as to what was there and what's changed. Okay. Some other things for us to think about with a transmit capable software defined radio, it may also be able possible to uh, capture data and replay it at a later date on modified. <clears throat> so that couldn't be possibly bad, right? Protocols designed with security through obscurity that don't do mutual authentication um, for, for example, stuff that is the one way only like the, uh, the transmitter for a garage door opener. I, I know that some of those use some rolling codes, but not all of them do. Um, the presentation remotes uh, that we use for advancing slides, um, the clicker that you hold in your hand, transmit only, the receiver plugged into your, your computer is receive only. What happens when we capture the, the clicker uh, we capture and replay that, your in, instructor's slides start moving uh, ahead when they didn't do anything. But it could also be a lot worse. Um, in 2016, um, Caleb Madrigal um, took a look at some of the data RF energy coming out of his clicker for uh, his remote keyless entry for his, uh, for his uh, Jeep Patriot his 2006 G Patriot. He was able to capture the signal and without a lot of decoding, raw signal able to replay it in the same format, capture a lock and unlock command, replay those uh, back with the same software defined radio unmodified and was able to both unlock and lock his Jeep. The question becomes, well, why is this dangerous? Well, it's dangerous in that the protocol as designed for this particular application didn't have any authentication, didn't have any security. Um, it happily accepted uh, unmodified traffic that was, was known to work. A and great, we provided opportunity for sort of breaking and entering, uh, maybe retrieving laptops from the trunk and, and, and so forth and so on. The problem really becomes is to, how do we fix this? And how do you fix potentially millions of vehicles that have a, an RF communication methods that is ultimately providing some security for that vehicle? How do you update those? Uh, and it may not be as simple as just a software update. And even still, software updating millions of potential vehicles in the field is also uh, uh, quite quite interesting. We've, we've seen this with some of the work from uh, Charlie Miller and so forth uh, with their ability to interact with some of the automobiles to, to drive on their own. Okay, so how do we start going about finding something that's, that's unknown? <clears throat> well, in order uh, to, to cover a lot of this in the time, um, we want to give you some some high level advice. The big one: put your hands on one of these devices, and if it does transmit, specifically here in the U.S., if it does transmit, it has to have gone through some testing by the Federal Communications Commission, uh, and each of those devices has a, a model um, identifier for the FCC to note that it has been tested. As part of the FCC testing, there are public documents that need to be filed that talk about which frequencies they transmit and depending on how much information they submit or how much they've made uh, public, may give you the frequencies, the modulation types, um, maybe even describe some of the protocol once you've demodulated. So looking at some of the FCC documentation is incredibly valuable. And I know the FCC is US centric, but in many cases, the product packaging is the same across the world. And those FCC identifiers are still on the product packaging with the same radio stuff going on. So leveraging those um, is, is appropriate. We find the frequency from the FCC filings or the various equivalents such as Industry Canada, tune to that frequency and operate the device. See what happens when you operate the device um, multiple times doing the same thing. Does it always have the same output? Um, if we take that same output, can we replay it to have the same, uh, same actions? Sometimes not, sometimes yes. 
this is very much where you start doing the deep dive. One, you got to find the signal. FCC is hugely helpful for that. Then uh, doing some capture replay and then doing some analysis with various tools to potentially recover the data and then potentially even modifying some of our data. Okay, so software defined radio is lots of fun. It's time consuming. There are lots of projects out there that have already gone down the route for some of the things that we want to analyze. Uh, and many of the hard work has already been done. And sometimes we can take some of these projects and change them just a little bit to, to work with, with our own applications. Okay. However, there are many cases where we already have uh, a lot of great tools for interacting with some of our more standard wireless-based technologies, such as is uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, we can absolutely do uh, Wi-Fi with an appropriately equipped software-defined radio. The problem is, is the the computation uh, that is required to do it, the setup, is. Uh, it, I'd estimate it would probably take me somewhere along the order of a month of man hours uh, to actually set up the, the system to be able to capture Wi-Fi packets. Uh, and that's with some of the pre-existing stuff um, with some fairly high-end software-defined radios. Or I can go to Amazon and I can pick up a $50 wireless adapter and do the same thing and have it up and running in about an hour. So there, there's some trade-offs for some of these. Uh, we can do this software-defined radio for lots of other protocols, but the implementation trade-off versus what's already there for uh, is is not always always smart. Sure, we can do something like Bluetooth as well, and Bluetooth is is all over the map for how it uses the spectrum, uh, and really requires a software-defined radio and some software that is not inexpensive. Um, some of the stuff is around 30,000 plus dollars to be able to sniff Bluetooth in its entirety. Uh, when in fact, it may just be smarter for us to, to interact with it in different ways. So the big point that we're getting here is use the right tool for the right job. Um, software defined radio is best for when we don't know what we're dealing with or when uh, other radios are not available, i.e. we don't have the ability to um, take some existing radio and turn it into uh, attack hardware. Uh, I think about this from the ADSB perspective. Um, it, it would be fairly esoteric and fairly expensive for us to purchase an ADSB transmitter and receiver for an aircraft um, to, to be able to turn that into an attack tool uh, when we can spend $300 uh, on a device that can do multiple of these types of attacks tools. All right, so so thinking about that, finishing up uh, a little bit early and giving Jason some time to, to uh, push over a couple of uh, questions as, as well. Um, picking a software-defined radio platform um, is, is potentially complex depending on what you want to do, uh, but I definitely recommend the HackRF, uh, HackRF1 uh, largely for its community support and the RTLSDR1 um, community support and very inexpensive to get into and doing lots of analysis. Much of my analysis in starting phases of any of this type of uh, assessment work is listen only. I just wanna see what's out there and see what I can do to compare before I even start transmitting. Okay. To me, visualization is key for both discovering uh, and then starting to interpret uh, the signals as well, as well as being able to do some uh, detection and building a baseline. Uh, and, and there's lots of projects out there um, that can be modified outside of their uh, original purpose. And based on what we've observed for doing the receive, we can now start to build our own on the transit, transmit based on the, the knowledge that we've gained there. All right. So, uh, Jason, I, I'm assuming that you may have a couple of questions. I have some questions. And if anyone else has questions, feel free to start asking them now. Uh, the first question is, is Larry, are there any CTFs for SDR? Ah, uh, yes. So are there any CTFs for SDR? Um, yes. They, they're not specifically um, SDR related, but I can think of two. Um, 6617 at our Capture the Flag at the end of the course does have some uh, software-defined radio component to it uh, amongst all of the other things that you learn in class. 
the other one uh, that I know they bring it to DEF CON and other places as well, there is a wireless CTF uh, in the Wi-Fi Village. Um, great bunch of guys that run it. They will give you a hard time um, because they really want you to learn. They, they very much subscribe to the offsec uh, try harder <laughs> methodology in that they want you to try to figure it out on your own. Uh, but they definitely do some software-defined radio stuff, um, including fox hunts, uh, finding transmitters of some variety. They include Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, software-defined radio, analyzing unknown signals, all of the above. And uh, I know the uh, the Wireless Village folks um, bring that to DEF CON, and they change it all the time. They also bring it to a bunch of other conferences as well, and I'm not exactly sure which ones. And Larry, I have a... Um, follow up with that. So you mentioned fox hunts, and for people who have never done a fox hunt before, can you please explain what a fox hunt is? Sure. Uh, so a fox hunt is uh, something that's sort of born out of the the ham radio community. It may have been been elsewhere as well, but I'm familiar with it from the the ham radio community. Uh, effectively, the fox hunt, someone as part of an organized fox hunt, uh, takes a small low powered transmitter, and they hide it. Then you have to do signals analysis, figure out which frequency you need to turn to, and they give you a range, uh, and then do some direction finding and uh, effectively you know, go through the woods in the park or wherever and uh, find where this transmitter is to quote, you know, bragging rights and or, and or prizes. Uh, overall, effectively what this is, is being able to do uh, location analysis based on, on the actual transmitted signal strength. And, and this is hugely helpful just outside of sort of this organized game for, hey, Larry's got vapor trail installed in my organization. Where is it? Well, we start doing some analysis of how strong the signal strength is based on various locations and directions that we're pointing with our antennas. And we can start being able to triangulate uh, where that quote rogue transmitter is. Larry, if someone wanted to organize a fox hunt in their organization, let, let's say they gave out the, the, the fox to an employee and then some of the employees had to, during a lunch break or something, try to find it. Is there any like setup instructions or anything that you could give for someone to potentially do that? Oh, um, I can't think of any off of the top of my head. Um, but thinking thinking about how to do some of that, um, you, you'd have to have some um, some rules and stuff around it. Um, I, I haven't participated in, in a fox hunt through some of the, the ham radio stuff. Uh, but I do remember uh, a while back playing with a specific application, and I can't remember what it is, um, that uses the GPIO pin on the Raspberry Pi uh, to transmit uh, and effectively become the, the fox that you have to hunt. So you could use something like a Raspberry Pi, a battery, and a piece of wire with some software to create to create a fox. Um, and, and I'll have to see if I can find that and, and to find an appropriate way to just sort of get that uh, that info out there. I think it might be a good opportunity for you know a blog post on how to how to organize a, a fox hunt. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, one of the attendees just said that they captain a wire wireless CTF team. They do fox hunts. Uh, so you could do a write up. So I'm going to reach out to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, question here from the audience. Uh, if working on a budget, what would be the best type of SDR to start with to get some good results, which could encourage further budgeting to expand on this type of testing? Thanks, Josh. Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> um, so that, that said, um, if, I were going into it as a budget, which I've done. Um, the the RTL SDR and budget somewhere between twenty and thirty five dollars for uh, receive only. Um, absolutely, uh, lots of fun to to get involved with there. That that's absolutely super super budget wise. Um, Otherwise, if you wanted some transmit capability, the the Hacker F1 would uh, would be one of my go-tos. It's 
three hundred ish dollars or so. Um, but another uh, one to certainly look at. I, I personally have not had a chance to to play with it. Um, but the Lime SDR, um, uh, the Lime SDR Mini specifically, it's a, a smaller form factor of the the newer Lime SDR. Um, they're about one hundred and fifty dollars, and they are very very capable uh, transmit and receive, and those all three of those and potentially all of those combined for me fit within uh the budget for my chief financial officer uh otherwise known as my wife um so so those are sort of my recommendations the the rtl sdr at 20 to 35 dollars is great for doing receive and starting to do some exploration with some some quite good results uh, just to figure out what the heck is out there and, and open your eyes to some of it uh, but the lime sdr mini and the hacker f1s are, are definitely uh, areas that i that i'd consider exploring if this becomes a huge passion um, and, and something that you you're going to do more of and need more capabilities um, pretty much anything from edis research is your go-to but you're going to spend lots of money Larry, I have um, a question. I was talking to Josh Wright the other day, who is your co-author for the wireless pen testing course. Yes. And one of the things that we were talking about was uh, wireless in ICS environments. Yes. Um, are you seeing or, or able to use this in ICS environments for pen testing industrial control systems? Uh, it, so it depends, uh, a absolutely. Um, I have done some some interaction with some some various proprietary stuff. Of course, uh, a lot of it under non-disclosure agreement. We've done some testing um, with smart meter vendors um, and, and various others uh, to try to try to uh, capture and observe some of their their protocols, um, ICS and otherwise. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and ICS is evolving just like any other industry in that they are looking to uh, adopt new, better, uh, more robust communications uh, methods. Um, one of those that I think of is uh, wireless heart, uh, which is a protocol that most people have, haven't heard of. It's been a heart. The heart protocol has been around for quite some time. Uh, wireless heart has been around for quite some time as well, but uh, not heard of a lot outside of the ICS industry. Um, some other ones that I that I can see some adoption for um, ICS is, um, uh, of course, now it's escaping me. Um, but v very much doing some recovery with software defined radio for some of that. Um, Absolutely, in ICS, and they're evolving just like any other uh, vertical as well. And uh, Jason, just to, to step back on the, the wireless CTF stuff, um, uh, Timothy uh, posted in, in chat there, uh, wctf.us, so wireless CTF, uh, wireless capture the flag, wctf. Uh, dot us uh, has the season schedule for the the CTF that I mentioned that they bring to DefCon and such. Hey, I have uh, one last question for you from myself. If anyone else has any additional questions, feel free to ask. Uh, you've done some work with the uh, CCDC Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Yes, sir. Um, specifically, specifically in the Mid Atlantic region. In the Mid Atlantic region, um, this is just mainly a volunteer kind of question is there a way you know if people are listening the remainder the people who are going to listen to the, the recording how would you because what i like is that you do volunteer you do get engaged and you do do these things where's a good place to to volunteer to to be able to use these skills or learn these skills that someone could use if they're not able to do it at work oh that's a that's a great question um some of the the things that it, it, obviously um, try building a lab um, on, on your own and and not so much the volunteer stuff but absolutely um, uh, build build a lab pick up an RTL SDR um, and experiment with some of the projects um, for example uh, I have a friend um, that was uh, stationed uh, in, in the Middle East uh, last summer and he, they they had lots of downtime. Um, 
And uh, as part of the care package that I sent to him, I sent him an RTL SDR and a little like uh, weather station uh, with a station that would read the temperature um, and uh, the little transmitter that measured the temperature and then sent it to the station um, with the intent that, hey, he now had everything he needed to try to reverse engineer the protocol for something that was fairly inexpensive. I think the whole weather station was $12. So getting involved and start playing with some of these stuff can can be very inexpensive. Um, they, those are those are one of my favorites is some of the, the weather stuff. <clears throat> um, as far as volunteering to, to learn some of this stuff, um, I, I'm I'm not super positive. I I'd maybe consider reaching out to the uh, the wireless CTF folks um, to see if they have any opportunities for volunteers. Um, and and I, I'd say that if it were me running those, I'd love to get some other folks involved to help them to 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 get better at what they're doing and potentially um, involve them in building new challenges as as you got better. Um, some other things, absolutely look into some of the um, the other groups, um, Jason, such as you mentioned, like uh, the Cyber Collegiate Defense Competition. <clears throat> um, uh, of the ones that I'm familiar ones, one of the more robust has been the Mid-Atlantic region in which that they bring all sorts of various components uh, into that. And I've included some some various RF and radio in that uh, when I was when I was involved. Um, so so absolutely there uh, there's definitely some volunteer opportunities um i'm just not positive on, on where i would find all of those at the moment okay uh one last comment was um uh hacker spaces are always a good place to get involved with those sorts of hacking good, related good activities good point uh <laughs> here let me i'm going to read this first offline before i read it to everyone else <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah, here we go. Uh, also, for labs, if you often rent cars, then you can learn to find and decode various car remotes as well as restaurant pagers. For Zigbee, uh, Samsung has a home lab for a hundred bucks. Thank you, yep. Chris. So, yeah, yeah. There's absolutely all sorts of all sorts of stuff out there. Um, your your rental car, maybe even your own car, um, your garage door openers. Um, if my my favorite one that that I need to actually talk with my neighbor about is uh, um, my, my neighbor uh, last summer got burglarized. Uh, someone broke into his home and and stole a bunch of stuff. And uh, what he did shortly thereafter was he contacted one of the the major alarm vendors, the good reputation, and they came and installed an alarm system for him. Um, and in the process of me investigating my weather sensors. I discovered that there was this other RF protocol out there, uh, and after doing some digging uh, with a with a tool called RTL 433, um, found that the folks that had authored RTL 433 had already done some analysis of those sensors that that I found that I didn't know what they were, and uh, sure enough, they are the door and window open and close contact sensors for the alarm system. Now my question becomes, can I capture that traffic and potentially replay them? I, my, my question is, can I capture the open state for my neighbor's window? Um, and then when it's closed at two o'clock in the morning, replay the open state over and over again so that they become desensitized to that particular window sensor being open. <laughs> and, and then when he's at work, actually go open the window. <clears throat> so those are the types of things I think about in my spare time. Well, I mean, you would have to hear a professional uh, ethical hacker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And of course, you note that I said I have to talk to my neighbor first before I do something like that. Right. Because it's uh, authorized. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, to close out today, I just have two comments from the audience. Uh, for, at Frustrated IT Guy, uh, Wasabi, they're always looking for volunteers on a limited basis. Make sure you contact him on Twitter. That's Wasabi at Frustrated IT Guy. And Chris says the Kismet Project is always looking for, uh, is a good group to get involved with. So the Kismet Project and Wasabi. And with yep. that, Larry, uh, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, I, I don't, but if you're you're interested in uh, taking a look at 617, um, uh, sams.org forward slash SEC 617 uh, to check out some of the, the upcoming classes. And I uh, hope to see you there and uh, we'll have lots of fun.
Awesome, Larry. Thank you so much. Let's turn it over to Carol uh, to end today's webcast. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Larry and Jason, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.